Hello, I'm Pete Devlin, your host in this episode of Access Door County. Now, we happen to have a pretty interesting collection in this room right now. There's only three of us, including the man behind the camera, but all three of us are Vietnam vets, including the man sitting beside me, Richard Biz Verley, who is a resident of the town of Sevastopol, uh, a native of Door County, a retired uh, uh, Door County Sheriff's deputy. And before that, you were in Vietnam, and I believe we probably did run into each other in Vietnam, Biz, um, because you guys in the, your Brownwater Navy, let's start with what Brownwater Navy is, I guess. And uh, since you were, you, you could explain it better than me. Well, the Brown Water Navy was, <clears throat> it got that name because of the, I was stationed at Cantho, right, right on the Mekong River. And the Mekong River uh, uh, comes down out of, out of uh, Laos and, and all the way through Vietnam and, and flows into the South China Sea. And of course, that water is brown compared to the ocean. Yeah. And uh, when I was sent there, I, I, I was in communications in the Navy, and, and uh, they sent uh, my group there to set up a communications for the riverboats on the Mekong River. And uh, they, they, would, they would go down the river or, or up the river trying to pick up survivors that, from uh, units that were, were shot up. And, of course, they would get all, a lot of firepower from the banks, and, they, and they, they needed help on that. So we set up the communication stations at the airfield in Canto, and uh, the, the name of the unit was ATCU. That's Air Transportable Communication Units which are vans, four vans, and four diesel six-cylinder six generators for the power. And uh, we built that, I put the antennas up and sandbagged all uh, the, uh, the vans in for protection. And uh, then the riverboats had could call on that communications and get air support. And I was one of those guys who got uh, overpowered on land. I was infantry. And we did the, the, the Mekong River as well, and uh, you guys uh, picked us up. Occasionally, you'd actually drop us off. Uh, so I, and we were over there at about the same time, so I guess you know, we, we probably met over there. And <laughs> yeah, very uh, likely. Didn't know each other then for 45 years afterward. Yeah. So you were, uh, you were in communications, you were Navy, I was Army. Uh, our, Producer, cameraman, etc., is also Army. Um, so I don't know. We, we could sit here and talk about Vietnam for a couple hours, but actually, the the, the and I'll let you talk about some of the things because you got some really interesting photographs there that you're going to share. Well, with us. Th this is a picture of me. Uh, I was getting ready to go to work that morning and and uh, got my picture snapped. Uh, we we were living in a villa right on the river and uh, we, we would get in a deuce and a half truck and, and drive over to the airfield to, to work on our communication stuff. And uh, they issued us greens in, in those days. And, you know, I was in the Navy, but you know, I maybe looked like an army guy, but yeah. I, I was in the Navy and-, and The hat's uh, different. The hat, the, we, in the army never had a hat like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of course we had our. I had an M14 rifle uh, uh, with a 20-shot clip and, and a 1911 45 caliber handgun. Yeah. And of course, all all the guns came with a with a with a bayonet and, mm -hmm. and stuff. So. And you guys had better weapons. Well, that's in in hindsight. You guys had better weapons with the 14 than we did with the M16. That was not a, well. It was, at that time, the technology was such that it wasn't really a good weapon to be going into uh, ambushes with, but, well, I'm still here 50 years later, so I guess it was adequate. <laughs> yeah. Now, you also have a picture of you in your whites. Yeah, this, this picture uh, was taken on board the USS Porterfield, which is a, a Fletcher-class destroyer. Mm -hmm. uh, 682 is a hull number. 
and there was a changing uh, uh, command aboard the Porterfield. We were docked in Yokosuka, Japan, and uh, there was a changing of the guard that morning, so of course we, everyone had to be dressed in whites, their white uniform, and uh, this, this was taken uh, in the last year that I was in the Navy, and I, I was, uh, at that point I was an E-4, or a third class petty officer, mm -hmm. uh, radio operator. And uh, yeah, that, that picture was taken uh, on, the, on the porter field, the deck of the porter field. We were moored right alongside another destroyer in our group in, in Yokosuka, Japan. And what year was that, if, I, if you remember? That was in 1967. I, yeah. I went in the Navy in December of 63, and I got out at the end of December of 67. So I did four years, did boot camp in San Diego, and did the Class A radio school, which was a half a year. That was also in, in San Diego. And then they shipped me to Japan for a couple of years, but then I got sidetracked, sent into Vietnam to, to help set up that communication station. Yeah, that's, uh, that is the time I was there. I was there in 67 also. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, the, I, I had three years of actual shore duty, and then my last year was aboard the, the destroyer. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we, we did our training off the coast of San Diego, and, and then uh, went back overseas, right over in uh, the Tonkin Gulf in South China Sea, and, and did uh, air support for the USS Constellation, uh, an attack carrier, CVA carrier, and... Uh, very busy in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, the sorority flights were day and night, steady. And, and the only break you got is when you went out to sea to rendezvous with a supply ship and take on fuel and take on ammunition and, and uh, stores, groceries, and, and then right back on, on the line back in the South China Sea. Yeah. So. so I got to ask, did you ever try Bami Ba? No, I don't think so. Bami Ba was a local beer. Uh, actually, I think it was more like bottled formaldehyde. It was not the, the, the most delicious beer, but it was the only beer sometimes available. In fact, I know I'm getting off the subject here, but we were actually ambushed alongside a road. And so here's my entire platoon laying down in the ditch on the side of the road, and here comes a woman from the nearby village with two of her children, mama son and baby son, as we called them. She's carrying, she, the, the, the children are each carrying a case of liquid refreshment. One was Bami Ba beer, and the other was Coca-Cola. And this woman had one glass, a block of ice, and she would come down this line, and we're, you know, we're exchanging gunfire. And she's selling us a glass of, of Coke or a glass of beer. Ten cents is what it costs. Uh, and when and she only had the one glass, so she'd wait right standing there while bullets are flying for the glass to get emptied. She'd sort of rub it around and then it'd go on to the next person. Hey, you want Coca-Cola? You want Bobby Bob? So anyway, you, you're lucky. You didn't miss anything with Bobby <laughs> Bob. <laughs> and, I, and so I will stop digressing here. So you came back to the States and you put on a different uniform, huh? Yeah, as I said, I, I got out and uh, right at the end of December of 67. And I, I, I kind of had my heart set on joining the Sheriff's Department. And I had talked to, uh, uh, actually it was the undersheriff at that time, which was Baldy Bridenhagen, yeah. because his wife Gloria at that time was sheriff. In those days, you could only run two terms, and then you couldn't run. So, so Baldy had his wife run, and Gloria got elected, and she appointed him under sheriff. So I talked to him uh, uh, about a job. He asked me, you know, about my service and, and what I did, and I told him I was in communications, and he said, well, there's just no openings, you know. But he said, you know, you can fill out an application, and... and uh, you know, at that time, everything was civil service. You can, you know, write the exam, and when there is an opening, you know, we could look at you for hiring you. So, I uh, I went to the Door County Library in Sturgeon Bay to get a civil service book, 
to study for the exam, and that's when I met the librarian, Sharon Jensen. And Sharon told me that she did not have a civil service book, but she could get one from the Brown County Library, and when it came in, she would call me. Which she did a few days later. She called and uh, said that she had the, had the book and I could pick it up. So I went down there and picked it up, and in a conversation with her, I asked her if she'd like to go to a movie with me, and she said, sure. And uh, that's when it started. And you smooth talking devil, huh? <laughs> yeah. And he, eventually we dated for, for a year, and in, uh, in, 19, in December of 68, uh, we married. So that's Sharon Jensen Verley now. And we've been married for uh, 48, 48, 48 years. years. Yeah. So, wow. yeah, that, that's where that started. And, and uh, eventually, uh, a gentleman by the name of John McCuskey, he was an elderly gentleman wor working at the sheriff department, and he was a radio operator and jailer. And uh, he uh, was, got sick and suddenly, within a few days, died. Mm. And uh, that created an opening, and, and uh, then eventually I got, I got hired at the sheriff department in 68. Okay. So, and I retired in 98, so I had 30 years there. And this picture uh, is a picture of me in my last, Keita Steves took this picture. And I was in my, if not the last day at, on the job, it was in the last week mm -hmm. when this picture was, was taken. And the cell that I'm standing by I'm, is upstairs in the old jail, which is all torn down, but they saved one cell and it's in the Door County uh, Museum on 4th Avenue. Yeah. If you go into the pioneer part where the fire trucks are, they got a jail cell in there and that's, that's one of these cells. I've got to ask you, do you still fit into that uniform? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I'm asking is we could, since the cell still exists, we could do another picture, couldn't we? Yeah. yeah the producer's saying, yeah, we could. <laughs> so uh, over 30 years, I had a pretty interesting career uh, in law yeah. enforcement. You were you were predominantly a jailer for that 30 years, right? Yeah, radio operator, jailer. At the time, the communications. Was was uh, was run by the sheriff department, and of course we had the jail. But uh, in those days, uh, Baldy was uh, was under sheriff, and uh, he he only had five deputies under him. Mm -hmm. There were there were uh, the four radio operator jailers, and then a sergeant, and that was it. That's all there was under the sheriff. And that was in 1968. And I believe it was in 1970, two years later, the county board decided to merge the Door County Sheriff's Office and take over the Door County Traffic Department, which was under Mus Millard. He was the captain, mm -hmm. and there was about a, a dozen patrolmen. And at that time, the county board put all of that under the sheriff. So it, he went from five people to, uh, to nearly 20 at that time and, and uh, took over all uh, the communications, of course, for, for Door County Sheriff's Office and the Sturgeon Bay Police Department, which is, is mm -hmm. yet today. They do all the communications for both. And then uh, that ended the, the Door County Traffic Department. It all, all became Door County Sheriff Department the way it is today. Now, I've heard a number of legendary stories about Baldy. I, I met the man once or twice, uh, but the, the one that I that I loved the most, I guess, was how he could handle any any outbreak of crime north of Sturgeon Bay. If they were looking for a suspect, they just put the bridge up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've heard that story. Is that what he did? Well, I I can remember when when uh, there was a. Uh, they were looking for a suspect that had uh, cut a body up. They mm -hmm. had all the parts. It was cut up with a chainsaw. And they knew that he was in Northern Door County. And I'm not saying that they put the bridge up, 
But they said that, that car, they knew the kind of car that he had, and that car, to leave the county, was going to have to go across that bridge or, or leave on by boat. Yeah. And uh, so part of that's true. They, they had, had uh, the, the sheriff department stationed at the bridge and uh, watching for that car. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think the car actually got all the way to the bridge. I think it was spotted somewhere right up in this area of Institute. I think they were down by the, the farm. So I think that's where they actually stopped the car and mm -hmm. took the man into custody. Hmm. So part of, part of that is, uh, is true. But yeah, Baldy was, uh, and of course he, he passed away in office. He, he got sick and passed away, but he, uh, he was he was uh, quite a sheriff. Yeah, he was. I'm th I'm told. I when I met him, it was um, I was working in radio news down in Green Bay at the time, and Norb Freilich was the sheriff in in Brown County, and they used to get together apparently on a you know couple of time a month basis just to compare notes, and I happened to be present at a couple of those times when they were comparing notes. And usually a beer or two. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So you were in, in your position within the sheriff's department or the sheriff traffic department for, or whichever it was. What are some of the, the more interesting moments in your career? Well, er, early in my career, uh, I, I, I served under four different sheriffs. But uh, under uh, Sheriff Baldy Bridenhagen, I believe it was right around 70 or 71. It was on a Sunday, and they picked up two suspects that were charged with burglary, the Wilson brothers. Okay. I remember them pretty clearly. Two young men, and uh, they were breaking into, into homes here in Sebastopol, and uh, they, they uh, found them and corralled them and, and arrested them and brought them to the jail. And uh, it was on a Sunday, and... Uh, I, I was working then and booked them into the jail. And in those days, things were run, I guess, kind of loose. Usually, we didn't like have visiting hours in, on a Sunday afternoon, but, but the sheriff, their girlfriends came in and wanted to talk to their boyfriends. And the sheriff told me, yeah, if you, you can put them in that, in that room uh, and put the girls on the other side of the, of the glass and, and let them visit which I did. And they were there for a while and then they left and, and I, I put them back in the, in the jail in their, in their cell. And when I got off duty at three o'clock, uh, I'm sure that they, they were there in, in the jail, but the next two shifts, the, the, the uh, three to 11 shift and the 11 to seven shift, they were there when they fed them at supper time but in the morning, when they went to serve breakfast, they were gone. Hmm. And one of the windows on the north side of the jail, the bars were sawed out, and there was a jailbreak, they escaped. They made it across the street to, to where, uh, well, for today the fire department is there, but back in those days it was the Sturgeon Bay High School, and a janitor had stopped there to, uh, to check things and he left his car running and went in to, to, to check a couple things and when he came out the car was gone and the Wilsons went across the street and they had stole that car and left town <laughs> and uh, the next day when I came to work in the morning at 7 and they realized the Wilsons had escaped the sheriff Bali was pretty excited <laughs> I think you could hear him downtown yelling <laughs> of how in the world this ever happened. Yeah. And it turned out that the girlfriends made this plan with their, with their boyfriends when they, when they visited, and they went downtown to a local gas station, and it was actually Sergeant's gas station, and, and Mr. Sergeant, the girls gave a song and dance story that they needed a hacksaw, they needed a pipe wrench, and a few other tools, and they wanted to borrow it, and then what's when they said they promised they would bring it all back when they were finished. Well, obviously they went up to the jail and, and uh, passed these 
tools through the, through the window and they sawed their way out and, mm -hmm. and escaped. Did Mr. Sargent get his tools back? I, I think that he eventually did. We gave him his hacksaw <laughs> and that stuff was all laying there when they escaped. But, you know, obviously we, we issued warrants for them. Yeah. And of course, we didn't know it at the time, but they were already out of state. And then we found out within a few days later that they did an armed robbery in, in uh, I, I believe, if it wasn't in St. Louis, it, it, it was right down in that area of a gas station. And there was a shootout, and one of the Wilson boys was shot and, and died from the wounds. And the other one was captured and, and wound up in prison. And we never got them back in Door County. Okay. We never got them back. That's going to be my next question. But that that uh, escape in seventy or seventy one was was uh, was a pretty big deal at the time. Yeah, and you were you were pretty much still a rookie at that point too. So sure, and and of course security at the jail tightened up a lot after that yeah. because. You know, in those days, we didn't even lock them in their cells, so they could go up and down the hallway and right to the access to them outside windows, where then after that, at night, usually right around 9 or 10 o'clock, they had to go in their cell and be locked in the cell, and then they wouldn't have had access to those outside windows. Hmm. So, you know, that all changed then, but it, it, it taught us that you had to be more, more careful. In your career uh, in the jail, did you ever have an Otis character, like in the Andy Griffin show, that would let himself into the cell, and then in the morning you'd let himself out? No, but there was situations like before I got hired. Where, yeah. uh, but we had Huber Law people where, where they spent time in jail, but they were left out for their job, and then, and then their eight hours of work, and then they had to come back to the jail. Okay. And that Huber Law is still t yet today. Yeah. Where, uh, and, and it's a good deal because they can be more self-supporting and, and pay their way where if they're just in jail and they're not working, well then the taxpayers are feeding them and taking care of their medical. We're talking, by the way, with Richard Biz Verley. He is a member of the County Board of Supervisors now. He's a retired Door County Sheriff's Deputy. He's a Vietnam vet who served uh, in the Navy over in the brown water areas, which is uh, along the Mekong River. And he's just an interesting character. So we're having fun just talking about it. The, the idea for this came to me probably five, six years ago that we would like to, to track down some retired law enforcement people and just talk about some of the experiences they had while uh, uh, wearing a uniform. The first one that, I, that I, I was talking to my son about this idea at a restaurant just outside of Madison. There was an older couple at the next table. And they overheard the conversation. He said, well, I'm a retired police officer. And he then right at that point uh, provided one of his most memorable uh, experiences. He was a, uh, a sheriff's deputy in the Madison area. And he recalled the night that uh, a car was speeding on Highway 151, and he pulled it over, only to discover that the uh, the guy was trying to get to the hospital because his wife was in the labor. And so he says, "I got on the radio, and this is back you know, 40 years ago. There weren't any other backups nearby." He says, "I called for help, and uh, uh, then as I'm waiting for for somebody to show up, this car pulls in behind." And the guy gets out, and he says, I'm, I'm the doctor. He says, what doctor? I'm their doctor. And so the doctor and the, the officer delivered the baby on the side of the road. And that, that was a pretty neat story that, I, uh, that got me started on this idea. Now, this is the first <laughs> one we're doing, is this with Biz. Um, I hope to, that we have others who come in and, uh, and tell us their stories of law enforcement as well. The most, you, you, the, the most memorable moment of, of your involvement was what? Was it, that, was it the Wilson brothers? Or? No. Actually, over 30 years' time, there were no deaths 
in the 30 years I worked there in the jail. Mm -hmm. But there were four attempted suicides that I can remember. And they're pretty clear in my mind because they were pretty, pretty uh, big deal at the time. The first one, and this was under Sheriff Bridenhagen, we, we uh, booked a, a, a young man into the jail. He was charged, I don't even remember what his charge was, but he was, he was booked in the jail. And in those days, they could have matches and cigarettes in their cell, you know, which is not allowed today, but that, in those days it was allowed. So he was in a holding cell. We had three of them, holding cells. And it was kind of a, a routine shift. It wasn't a lot going on. And some hours later, after he was booked into the jail, we could smell smoke. And all of a sudden, we heard a prisoner yelling. And I went back and by this holding cell and looked. I couldn't believe my eyes. Over in the area where the toilet was, flames were going up all the way to the ceiling. Here he took his, his uh, blankets and pillow and stuff and he set it on top of the toilet and got it all on fire and he had a big fire going in the cell. So I ran back to the radio room, got the jail key, the keys to open the door and we dragged the prisoner out of there. The, the whole place was filling up with black smoke. And we dragged him all the way from the cell into the radio room, and he was lying on the floor. And I was certain that he had already passed away. He was not breathing. So we called for, at that time there weren't paramedics, but they were EMTs because the ambulance service was fairly new at that time. And started doing CPR on this, on this, this young man. And uh, the, the person that was working on him was John Brunswick, who's, who's passed away now. But he was the EMT, and he was doing CPR. And another uh, EMT by the name of Joel Mangle was helping him. And I remember standing there watching, and all of a sudden, the prisoner's eyes opened, and he started coughing. And when he could talk a little bit, he asked the EMTs, am I going to die? Hmm. At that point, he did not know that he had already was unconscious, not breathing, and they brought him back to life, transported him to the hospital, and to my knowledge, I, he never died, so he, he, was, he was alive. He went to court for his charges, and, and that was it. Another one was a female, and she was in a cell upstairs, and in those days they had to have a female, they called a matron, a female jailer. And this young lady was, was uh, in jail for drug charges, marijuana charges, and she was pregnant. And she tore a ribbon off the sheet, and she hung herself in the doorway of the cell by her her neck. And of course the, the matron or the female jailer, you know, right away screamed for help. There was a meeting going on on the upstairs of, of the safety building and uh, the chief of police at that time was Howard Larson and he ran over there and got a hold of her and lifted up on her and got the, the sheet untied. Took her to the hospital, she had already turned purple took her to the hospital, and the end result was she lived, and the baby was born later, and the baby was normal. So it was another very close attempted suicide, but not, not successful in killing themselves. Do you have any theory on why people do that, and why they get to jail and then they just want to do themselves in? Well, I think I think sometimes they're they're overwhelmed by like this is the end. I'm, I got these charges. Believe it or not, they taught us in school that 
a prominent businessman, very successful person that's in business, and maybe he gets picked up at night for drunk driving. He's a type of person that might attempt suicide, and it's, it's based mostly on embarrassment and like, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a family man, and what are my kids going to think? And they think the way to, is to end it. And they can be, they can be a, a very potential person for, for attempting suicide. So, so they, part of your training then as a, as a jailer was to, to be aware of those situations. Oh, sure. And, and as, as time went on and we went to school, they had to have 30-minute checks on prisoners where you actually went in and, and checked on the prisoner. Uh, these, the, when the Wilsons escaped, there were, no one checked on them. After supper, they never, they, there was no lockdown, there was no checking up, so they went for, for eight or ten hours and no one even checked on them. Well, that's not the way it's run today. Yeah. So another one was, was uh, in those days, you, you uh, would let the prisoner make phone calls, and we had a long cord that we could plug in and pass it into different cells. And he had his his phone and he made some phone calls and he decided to attempt suicide and wrapped the cord around his neck. And when I found him, he was already turned purple, his face, and took him to the hospital and he survived and, and uh, was not a successful suicide. And the fourth one was, a, was a, a prisoner that slashed his wrist. And as I remember it, he went to the hospital for sutures, but there was a lot of blood, but, but he didn't bleed to death. So that was not so. But those four really stand out in my mind, and, I, and here I am retired, you know, since 98, since, uh, uh, and I remember those, because though you, you just don't yeah. forget stuff like no. that. You know, you mentioned the calling the EMTs for one of the, your four. This is a this is a question I'm going to put to you, based on your county board experience now, and the fact that Door County is unique in having the uh, a county run ambulance department, as opposed to uh, the other well, 70 of the other 71 counties in, in Wisconsin have their ambulance service operated by fire departments and the like. So it's a county department. There are paramedics on duty 24 hours a day. Uh, I believe there are three crews uh, that are always on duty. What do you, what, what, what's your thought on the, uh, the level of service that is provided here in Door County compared with every, every other places? We probably at this point have if not the best, one of the best paramedic services in the entire state of Wisconsin. In fact, maybe even across the nation. But I can tell you how it all started. Early in my career, the mortuaries went, when people called and their husband had a heart attack or, or something, they, they, they called the mortuaries in those days mm -hmm. because they had, they had the hearse and they could, they could go pick people up. Well. They announced under, under Sheriff Bridenhagen, they put an article in the Advocate that they were no longer going to do that. You know, they, were, they uh, picked up uh, cadavers or people that had passed away and they were not going to be in the rescue business. So Sheriff Bridenhagen took it upon himself that we have to have an a ambulance service where we can help the, the people of Door County. So he, he purchased an Oldsmobile, was the first one, that you could put a gurney in uh, to, to haul people. And they hired uh, Fritz Brunswick, was the first person that operated that. And radio operators actually were the drivers hmm. in those days. And it ran like that for... for uh, Oh, a year or more, and, and uh, then they knew they had to hire full-time people. The fire department's really, the only full-time fire department that Door County had was in Sturgeon Bay, 
And of course, all the fire departments in Northern Door County and Southern Door County were volunteer. So it really wasn't an option for them to do it. So that Door County became, became one of the only counties that, that was county run. And like I said, in those days there, there were uh, EMTs and they were at home, they had to leave home and, and, and uh, when, when the radio room would call them and say they had a call either out of Sister Bay or out of Sturgeon Bay and they would, they would rush in and then, and then go and try to attempt to save the, the person if it was a heart attack victim or an accident. Because during that period when, when uh, before the ambulance, the Door County Traffic Department, which later became the, all of the Door County Sheriff Department, the squad cars were station wagons. They were all station wagons. And they had a gurney in the back. So when they arrived at an accident scene and people were hurt bad, the deputy would, with help from citizens, would get this person loaded on a gurney, put it in the station wagon, and drive into the hospital. And probably 100% of the time, no one was taking care of the patient. They were back there by themselves, and some cases bleeding bad or, or whatever their injuries were, and you got them into the emergency room, and, and that's the way it was done in those days. Yeah. And people, maybe uh, a lot of, especially the younger people, don't realize, you know, the service we have today compared to where it was, you know, back in those days. I think that since again, I'll mention that we got three Vietnam veterans in this room right now. My opinion is that it was the level of medical attention that we received in Vietnam that has directly led to the kind of service that you take for granted today. Because there were times when uh, uh, people were presumed dead, but we put them in medevac choppers, got them back to the, uh, the field hospitals, and uh, two months later they were back on the line with us. Sure. Yeah. And so I, I, I am just, I'm happy to live so close to such an excellent medical care system, in my humble opinion. That's right. Yeah. Door County is, is such a unique county and being a, a long, slender county, basically most of the county surrounded by water. It's not like other counties in the state where they might have four neighbors on four sides of their county when things happen where they can get help. And that's not the case in Door County. Being surrounded by water, and, that, and that, that's why we have five different school systems and, and uh, you know, they're spread out where, where probably a lot of counties maybe have a centrally located one that, could, that can handle it. But being a, uh, uh, a long, slender county is, is, uh, makes it more difficult for law enforcement, makes it more difficult for the ambulance service, the fire department, the school system. It's just the way our layout. And, and then, and then uh, that fifth school system is up on Washington Island, of course, and there, there they have their own, they have to provide everything for themselves yeah. up there. But they have an ambulance up there and a fire department and school system, and, and uh, they're definitely part of Door County, but they're really isolated being, being an island. So you came back to Door County after you got out of the service. Were you born here in Sevastopol? I was born in Sturgeon Bay. My, my uh, mother and dad, uh, Lawrence and, and Jen Verley, uh, lived in Sturgeon Bay. And uh, Sharon's mother and dad, George and Edna Jensen, uh, when I married Sharon, uh, her dad was the fire chief. Okay. George Jensen was chief at that time. So we're, we're both natives. We were yeah. born and raised uh, uh, actually in the what's called the Dorchester now, that was the hospital back in those days, and we were both born there. And uh, the only time that I've really been away for any length of time was my four years in the Navy. You know, I, I've been, uh, I've, my wife and I have traveled throughout the world. In fact, I took her back to Vietnam. I took her to where I was stationed mm. a few years ago, so she saw the villa where, where I lived and uh, the airfield. But, uh, 
so we, we've been on vacations where we're gone for a couple of weeks, but uh, being gone for four years, uh, that, that was really the only long period of time where I, where I was out of Door County or out of Sturgeon Bay. How did it feel to go back to Vietnam and, and go back to where you were? I, I guess for me, it, I, I always talked about to my wife of wanting to go back and, and go, and, and she said, Biz, if you want to go, you're going to have to go by yourself. I just, she just didn't care to go. She was too afraid. But, and I was talking about it probably even prior to uh, President Clinton. When he was president of the United States, he's the one that started the uh, import-export out of Vietnam. Yeah. That, when that happened under President Clinton, that opened up the tourist industry in Vietnam. Today, it's a very, very popular place that thousands and thousands of people visit Vietnam now. It's, it, it's uh, and when I went back, it wasn't just to where I was stationed. We started in Hanoi, and, and uh, where John McCain was held for five years at the Holo prison. Uh, the Hilton, I guess the prisoners called it then. Hanoi, the Hanoi Hilton. Hilton. Yep. But that's the Holo prison, which is a museum today, and, and uh, tourists can go there. And we started up in the, and that's way in the, in the, the north end of, of uh, Vietnam, and we traveled through major cities all the way down through the entire country over three weeks, and ended up in Canto, where I was stationed. And uh, I hired a cab, and, and the two of us went away from our group. We were traveling with Grand Circle. But pictures that I had taken back in 66, for instance, the big Catholic church in downtown Saigon, which is Ho Chi Minh City today, with the real tall steeples. Been there, seen that. <laughs> it's, it's there today, and it's the same. Yeah. There's gardens in front, and they change the landscape. But the building is basically the same as when I was there in the mm -hmm. 60s, is there that today, Al along with the post office and, and uh, uh, all of the major buildings in, in Saigon. And I had pictures of them, and, and uh, down on the waterfront, there's that building with the big clock. And that, that's all there yet today. Yeah. It, Saigon was never bombed, so those, none of those buildings were destroyed. That was because of us guys in 199th Light Infantry. We kept the VC out of Saigon. Yeah. That was our task. That was our job was sure. to do the perimeter around the city. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, so, I, I, I'm pretty much out of questions. I do have one thing to point out again. If you hold up your picture of you on your retirement uh, in the jail, you mentioned that was photographed by Keita Steves. Keita is, uh, she passed away several years ago, but uh, she was a longtime reporter for the Door County Advocate. And I started writing a column for the Advocate about the same time that uh, that Keita was sort of winding down, and we discovered that we share a birthday. Uh, the same day uh, was was the birthday for the two of us, and so we we just nodded each other and we, you know, happy birthday kind of thing. Biz, I am, I'm just delighted to have done this interview. Um, mm -hmm. Did I did I give you any or did I eliminate? No, that's not the word I'm looking for. Did I, am I cutting you off when you still have tales to tell? No, not really. You know, I, we could sit here for, for another hour or two yeah. and I could tell you all kinds, you know, obviously over 30 years a lot of stuff happened. Yeah. You know, uh, what, one other thing I just want to mention, and I don't think they do it nowadays, but back in those days, you know, Baldy being the person that he was, when, when the computer system was developed and, and you could get pretty instant information on people. All you needed was their name and their date of birth. Yeah. And you could plug it into the computer and it would come up if there were any outstanding warrants or stuff. So what he did, and he did this over a couple of summers, he would go out to the Door County Fair and go to the, the main office, usually it was one of those semi-trailers, the, the office, and 
he would say to the owner of, of the fair that I would like to have the name and date of birth of all your employees that are running these rides. All of, all of them. So he would come back to the communication room with 25 or 30 names and date of births. And we'd run them in the computer. And lo and behold, eight or 10 of them, there'd be outstanding warrants for them. Hmm. And the owner of the fair would say, you're going to put me out of bed. I have no one to run the rides. He said, well, these people are all have warrants for places that you've been where maybe they're charged with a sex assault or they're charged and, and they're wanted. And he did that a couple of years. And I remember that being, yeah, these people were wanted and, and had to go to court, but it really was devastating to the fair because... He needed, you know, these people were people that traveled with the fair yeah. and, and uh, ran the rides. Carnies, and, I the think. The carnies. They, yeah. they were usually, didn't they have, they weren't dressed in suits. They, well, they, had, they had a little grease on their hands yeah. from putting rides together. And, and, but in those days, that, that was done. And that's one of the things that he did over a couple <laughs> of years. And then I don't think they did it anymore. But, but probably by that time, the, the reputation had been made and... And the owners of the carnival would come to town knowing that they don't have any employees who are I wanted. Wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that if they would have got that. So the names and date of births of everyone at the, at the fair that we had just this past week, there yeah. might have been a couple of them but they had outstanding warrants. But I don't think they do that anymore. But uh, no, I, like I said, we could talk here about, about Vietnam. We could talk about the Door County Sheriff's Office. And today they got their brand new building that, that it's already what, about 10 years yeah. old. Actually, when I ran for county board, after I retired in 98, in 2000, I took out papers and I wanted to get on the county board. And the main reason I wanted to get on the county board was to get the new jail built. I knew how bad we needed it. And at that time, uh, Leo Zipper was, was the county board chairman. And the county board wanted to borrow $30 million to build a, a justice center and to build a, a oh, new yeah. highway garage and to build the ambulance at Sister Bay. And of course, there was a lot of opposition, and, and it wound up being a recall election, and most of us lost our seat on the county board. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was mainly because the people that, that were against this whole thing were really not telling the public the absolute truth. I know in my district, they went around and said, business on, he's, he's your representative, and he wants to build a $30 million jail. It's insane. Well, that was not, that was not true because they were going to build a, a justice center, which was the entire judicial system. The jail, yes, but the courtrooms, the district attorney's office, the child support, the uh, clerk of court, all of the judicial system was, go was in that justice center. The jail was just a small part of it. And then, of course, that $30 million was also for the highway shop and the ambulance. So they weren't really telling the truth when they said I wanted to build a $30 million jail. And, and of course, I lost my seat. But then the following April, all of us that lost our seat in the recall election, I think all of us got right back on the county board when the public found out the real truth. So. Yeah, the, I, I, I saw the building get built, and we're using it today, and, and, uh, and we've got other accomplishments since then. I've been on the board, and right now the, the thing that's going on is the, uh, the new senior center, community center, whatever. And I'm just uh, about to, to segue into that, yeah. And then the brand new ambulance garage. And if you will, I'll just tell you a, a little bit of how that happened. If I can interrupt for just one second, Biz is the chairman of the county board's property committee. So he's in a real good spot to tell this story. So I'm sorry. I... So 
where the existing senior center is, they, the plan was to build a new center just on the south side of it, which would go into the parking lot of the, of the John Miles Park out at the fairgrounds. Well, I, I knew from being a native that whole area was, is all wetland that was filled in. It's not, it's not a high ground area. That parking lot, sure, today it's a beautiful gravel parking lot, but they put in thousands of yards of fill in there and filled that in. Well, it turned out when, when they drew the building up and how they were going to do the water retention, they wanted to put an underground system in to hold the water and release it gradually. And it was going to be a high maintenance thing, and the county board was not really full of, you know, supporting of doing that. The other thing was they were going to build a, a new paramedic and, and ambulance garage on property that was owned by Door County Memorial Hospital. And we told Leo Zipper and others that we want to buy the property. We don't want to lease the property like we currently are doing right now, where the ambulances right now as we sit here and talk, we're leasing from, from the Door County Memorial Hospital. And they would like us to, to leave because they have big plans of what they're doing on that side of the hospital. So I knew that there wasn't a lot of support on the, on the county board to get into a, a, a lease agreement with Door County Memorial Hospital. So after a, a meeting in the, in the government center, at the time the chairman of the county board was Dan Austed. And I said to Dan is sitting there, I said, you know Dan, we're always trying to figure out what to do with that old highway shop that we're renting to Palmer Johnson's. I said, do you suppose that building has got enough square footage to not only put the senior center there, but also the, the ambulance? And his answer to me was, boy, that building with all those garage doors, that is, it's huge. He said, I wouldn't be surprised, that building is so big. And for those who aren't familiar, it's the... the the building we're talking about, or the business talking about, is on 14th Avenue, uh, essentially just south of the CVS Pharmacy at Egg Harbor Road and, and 14th. And the, if you drive by for the next several months, you'll see that construction is taking place. Mm -hmm. Back to you, sir. So, and I remember his words clearly. The chairman of the county board, Dan Austin, said to me, you're chairman of the property committee. Why don't you call a special meeting and see what the committee thinks of it? So I did. I got a hold of, of uh, the county clerk, Joe Lau. I said, I want to call a special meeting. And I can tell you the meeting, we had the meeting, we talked about renovating that building and making both of those departments there. And we got a 100% vote to do a study. They said, we'll do a study and we'll see what a firm, and we wound up hiring venture architects, to have them go in there and look at the whole thing and come back to us with a report on whether they think it's feasible to even to do something like this. And of course, to make a long story short, months later after that study came back, the answer was, that building could be renovated, that's an old building, but it's a sturdy building. It could be made into a Door County Senior Center community and house the ADRC, the adult disability people, and all of, all of the, uh, that, that department. And then on the north end, save some of those garage areas for ambulance and their sleeping quarters and for the paramedics. And it's all under under renovation as we sit here and talk. And you'd expect to bring it in for a little under 10 million, right? That's, that was, was the way it, it's uh, worded that it would be just under $10 million to do this. And I can tell you from the last reports that I got and going through there, they're ahead of schedule. They originally said we'd be able to move in in January of 2018, both departments. And now they're saying December move in because they want to demolition the old senior center once they're out because that's also going to become part of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. 
and they feel that they'll be able to do it once they're out that this winter that building will come down and uh, that'll become part of the parking lot and they I'm not going to say it's going to be completely done like landscaping paving everything complete but the inside of the building would be ready for the the both departments to move in so it's probably a good point to, to end the discussion this has been a delight. I, I, I see that an hour has gone by, and it's just, it doesn't feel like it to me. No. You've been uh, watching Access Door County on Sevastopol Television. Again, I'm Pete Devlin. Our guest is Richard Biz Verley. Uh, you might call him a Renaissance man, Vietnam vet, uh, uh, sheriff's deputy, county board uh, member, and probably a few other things that I didn't think of. Thank you very much for, for watching us.